Let's bow our heads together. Holy One, beyond naming or knowing, we come to you as people who do not know how to slow down or to rest. Your prophet Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Well, here we, here we are, Lord, weary <clears throat> of so much <clears throat> that is not right with the world and carrying the heavy burden that is guilt over our complicity with all that's not right with the world. Why haven't I done more, we think to ourselves. Why do I sacrifice so little? Why do I consume so much? Thus immobilized by our inability to do more, we do even less and then wonder why more isn't being done. We have just enough guilt to make us feel miserable, but not enough to make us feel responsible, response able, able to respond. So just when things are getting crazier and crazier, we need to take five, step back. Remember that we are useless if we are just tired all the time. So our prayer is a reminder to drink more deeply from the well that is true faith, which is trust. Trust that we are not working alone, lest we become spiritually dehydrated. Help us, Lord, to be more than empty, cranky vessels. Show us the power of doing little things that show mercy and compassion, because we are powerful when we are not acting in self-important ways. We are agents of healing when we forget about being regarded as such. We raise children of promise when we do not push them to be just like us. How good and right it is for us to remember that Jesus never told us to love our religion, but to love our neighbor. And how reassuring that he never promised us certainty, but rest. Don't forget to flip the pillow over to the cool side. That's the side Jesus is on. Amen. Scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, the first chapter, verses 4 through 10, under the heading, Jeremiah's Call and Commission. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth, so... See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Here ends this reading from our tradition. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. We're in the heavyweight division of prophets this morning. Jeremiah is up there with Isaiah, Moses, and Daniel, the prophet hall of fame, if you will. This is Jeremiah's call story received from God, so to speak, in the 13th year of the reign of King Josiah. It was not a particularly good time to be called into this particular line of work. Israel lay between the major powers of the time, Egypt to the south and the Babylonian Empire to the north, a tiny sliver of fertile land perfect for a trade route in between the empires. And as we can see in our news headlines today, controlling trade routes is a critical function of empire. 
Israel was under the constant threat of invasion, and they saw their ability to avoid such conquering as a mark of God's protection, God's favor. So when invasion was imminent, it was a theological as well as political crisis. And the role of prophet, Jeremiah in particular, was to point out that God seeks covenant, meaning that God's favor comes with strings attached. God expects from us righteousness the biblical code word for doing the right thing. And when we systematize injustice and oppression, when we build social structures that foster and protect greed and inequality, we are not producing righteousness. At least that's what the prophets say and what Jeremiah said to Israel. Jeremiah was a PK, a preacher's kid, raised in the central highlands in the territory of the tribe of Benjamin, the priestly class of the 12 tribes of Israel. In the conflict of leadership that occurs right after King David's time on the throne, this subsection of the priestly class was banished for their descent of the David program, a sort of make Israel great again merger of military patriotism and religious authority. Jeremiah was raised in a family that had long been opposed to this trajectory of economic military autonomy, which David had started and Solomon continued. So Jeremiah had his work cut out for him. The purpose of the prophet in the biblical world is to deliver the word of God. So we need to unpack that a little bit because we think of the word of God as the Bible, But the Bible did not exist until the fourth century. And before there was a Bible, before people even wrote things down, there was revelation, prophecy, the speaking of God's will from people who were seen as conduits for divine proclamation. But here's the thing with such proclamation. Conduits are contextual. A prophet might be recognized by some people and flatly rejected by others. How do you know when a prophet is really delivering the word of God? And how do we hold up the word of God as a possibility, even in our day, when words are written out on a page and we still translate and interpret them differently, based largely on context? So again, Jeremiah had his work cut out for him. And we could talk a lot about what makes for a prophet and probably come up with a variety of lists, but what we really should talk about is what prophets do, their action, what they do, and that is they proclaim, they examine, they look at the world around them and ask why it is not better. And in the Bible, they do this in very specific ways. They always, always speak of justice, of mercy, and of the ways that we as human beings seek grace for ourselves, but often fail to give that same grace to our neighbors. Prophets do things that call out this habit. Acting as the voice of God, they announce God's judgment. We tend to hear judgment as individual, God's wrath called down upon a person for something they've done, And that's a little bit of a byproduct of a culture that sees a lot of things, if not everything, through the lens of self. But it was not so for the ancient Hebrews, whose prophets speak of judgment on Israel itself, on the systems and the corporate structure. Judgment is often understood as a negative thing, by and large, and we often attach to it images of a punitive, angry God, But that's not what is at work in the ancient Hebrew model of God. There we find judgment as a natural and cyclical consequence of the breaking of covenant or people not being righteous. Think of it as Judeo-Christian karma. You get what's coming to you. If you act unjustly, justice comes knocking. If you treat people unfairly, God writes the scales. Now, we may be able to give a lot of examples where this seems not to be the case, but 
The biblical prophetic witness claims that God's justice always comes. So if it ain't here yet, just wait. It's on its way. In our context, if this prophetic genre is going to still have an impact on us, and I think we need it to, we will need some redefinition of things like judgment and righteousness. We have been taught by the biggest chunk of Christian expression in the 20th century that righteousness is found in identity. It is what group you belong to, what church you are a member of, what profession of faith you make, what baptism you have. Righteousness is often presented as if it is contained in carefully selected lists of do's and don'ts that you need to at least appear to follow, almost as if it's more important to look righteous than it is actually to be righteous. This is how a nation can label its leader righteous despite having affairs, questionable business practice, and lies and manipulates to get what he wants. I am, of course, talking about King David. (laughs) Y'all thought something else. All of this talk of righteousness and judgment makes most of us relieved that it is Jeremiah, not us, who was called. But of course, having heard the text, it is obvious Jeremiah would prefer God call someone else. If we let it, the story surprises us a little. It is astonishing that Jeremiah hears the voice of God giving him explicit instructions. On the one hand, it might make life so much easier if God were that direct with us. To have uncertainty cleared up like that would save us a lot of trouble and worry. On the other hand, we might not like what we hear. Jeremiah, for instance, was not thrilled with the word of the Lord. Ah, Lord God, he responds. And I kind of feel like Jeremiah's ah, Lord God was slightly less than reverent. As in, he might have chosen another four-letter word if he hadn't been talking to God. And then he follows that up pretty quickly with a couple of excuses. Truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am just a boy. That first excuse, truly, I do not know how to speak, quite frankly, wasn't a brilliant move on Jeremiah's part. Uh, You see, Moses had already tried this one with God. In an even more astonishing call story than Jeremiah's, Moses is confronted by an angel of the Lord who appeared to him in the flames of a burning bush. And from that burning bush, God called Moses to lead the Israelites out of bondage. Moses is also not thrilled. Dude is just trying to make a living, worry about himself, keep food on the table. Also, he had an outstanding arrest warrant back in Egypt. So he tries to get out of it. Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. But God, Elizabeth warned Moses, saying, I have a plan for that. I will help you speak and teach you what to say. And that is, of course, What happens? Why Jeremiah thought it would be any different for him, I'm not sure. But maybe Jeremiah really didn't think that was an excuse that would work, for he followed it up really quickly with a second excuse. I'm just a boy, too young God, too inexperienced. They won't listen to me. It is at this point that God gives Jeremiah the side eye. And she doesn't even try to be nice about it. She doesn't disagree with Jeremiah's self-assessment. God does not say, oh, Jeremiah, you're wise beyond your years. Or, you have a sparkling personality, it'll be fine. So, in a way, God says to Jeremiah, you are enough. You shall go 
to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. When Jeremiah says, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy, God responds with, that doesn't let you off the hook. I'm still going to need you to do what I've called you to do. You are enough. We know the rest of the story. Like Moses, Jeremiah grows into his role. He becomes quite good at speaking. He does indeed become a prophet to the nations, fulfilling his charge, as the text says, to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And what a neat story, right? What a, what a lovely tale of divine insistence and personal fulfillment. I mean, of course, this is Jeremiah we're talking about. He was really something like Moses and Daniel. I mean, of course their call stories are like this. And of course they say yes. And of course it works out the way it does. I mean, the call stories of the major prophets really couldn't be any other way. And thank goodness it was they who were called. I mean, after all, we're the ones who are really too young, too old, too busy, too inexperienced, too awkward, too dumb, too unprepared, too poor, too rich, too uncertain, too far down another road, too close for comfort, too far from seeing the final result, too stuck in our ways, too fill in the blank to be the ones God is asking to do the plucking up and pulling down, destroying and overthrowing, building and replanting. But as Saint Augustine said, without God, we cannot. Without us, God will not. So these call stories in the Bible, they are our stories, whether we like it or not. Our excuses for why we can't possibly do the work have remained remarkably unchanged over the millennia, but not unrelated is that God's thoughts on our aptitude have also remained remarkably unchanged. To be sure, most people I know don't hear their call through a burning bush or the audible voice of God. But they hear their call because the need is there. Most people I know hear their call as a deep, deep conviction that how they live really matters, and it is the work itself that draws them in. They do the work whether or not someone is watching, whether or not they form a 501c3, whether or not they draw a paycheck for it. It's why so many things at this church exist, from 363 to the Mayflower Medical Outreach. In a few weeks, Jennifer Seal, along with Lloyd Musselman and Melissa Lujan, will, will lead a teach-in on the history of Japanese internment camps and the lesson it holds for today as we as a nation are once again in the business of separating families and detaining people. So those three are doing something about it. And then there are the rest of you. Teachers, lawyers, retirees, nurses, caregivers, parents, students, janitors, chaplains, nurses, tutors, mentors, foster families, and volunteers who are doing righteousness how they can, where they are. And this is, in large part, I think, because of the first line in our text. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Which is to say, our lives have been dedicated and ordained the work of prophets is in our DNA. You've probably heard that verse as a proof text in the politics of reproductive choice, but Jewish rabbis and scholars will tell you it's not about that and hasn't ever been. Those verses are about the sovereignty of God 
and the call that comes standard issue in every child of God. The call to pluck up, pull down, destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. There are chains to be broken, unjust systems to be overthrown, walls to be pulled down, hate, intolerance, and misunderstanding to be plucked up, a more just and peaceful world to build, and trees to plant, even if it is our children's children who will enjoy the shade. If we want a garden, we have to sow the seed. Let's go get some dirt under our fingernails. <laughs>